we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby Land where maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jackwagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike. I'm online and I'm live with you today. Uh, Still not 100%, uh, but I'm working on it. Um, I want to make an announcement here, the Prophecy Roadshow. As soon as that audio stops doing that crazy thing, it always does it at the beginning of the program. Um, But the Prophecy Roadshow is going to be tomorrow in uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. Yay, Fort Smith, everybody. Uh, I'm trying to find the uh, address here for everybody. It will be at the first Free Will Baptist Church in Fort Smith, Arkansas. That is at 4001 Armor Avenue, Fort Smith. Uh, Services begin, I believe, at 7 o'clock. Let me give you the... uh, Let me give you the church phone number, 479-782-6657. I will give you Pastor Ernie Emerald's phone number in case you are in the area and would like to come, would like directions there or whatever, 479-466-7703. Um, I've met Pastor Ernie and his wonderful wife. They came up to visit here a couple of years ago, and uh, they've been watching us for quite some time. I've actually been to that church before several years ago when they had um, another pastor. Uh, He's since retired, and I think now he's gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, But Pastor Ernie has been there. He is a bivocational pastor. Uh, which means he works a full-time job plus pastors. The church is not all that big. Uh, But uh, let me tell you, God didn't call us to have big churches. He didn't. If you look at the parable of the seed and the sower, God is the one who brings the increase, some 30-fold, some 60, some 100. And, And that's up to God. How many? Rick Warren made everybody feel guilty for having churches less than, a, I guess, a thousand people. Just made them feel guilty. You're a dead church. You're not doing anything, and it's your fault. And he said in his Purpose Driven Church book, he said, we should, we should remove ourselves from the notion that prayer alone can build a thriving, lively church. Well, he's an idiot and he and a reprobate and knows nothing about the work of God. It is prayer. It is study in the word of God. It is waiting on the Lord. It is letting you sowing the seed, watering the seed, and then worry, let God worry about the increase of that seed and so no shame there whatsoever on the size of the congregation those people who go to that church they need a good pastor who preaches the word of god just like anybody else does and why should that church fold up because they've only got 30 40 50 people there and then make them scatter them out to go to some NIV or New English Version Church or some coffee shop church where they're not going to get anything from the Word of God. So thank God for small churches 
and who have good pastors who are going to lead that flock, no matter how big or small they are, but they're going to lead them right. They're going to they're going to stand for what's right. They're going to love sinners, try to reach out to win souls, but it'll be God who decides the size of that church. Rick Warren got it all wrong, completely wrong in thinking that the number of people that go to a church determines how much involved God is in that church. It was a lie. And at one time, I fell for it. I felt for that lie. And um, glad I, I don't believe that anymore. I, I, I turned it over to God. I said, God, you're the one. Because God whipped me one time. I, I hadn't been here too long. And we had a Sunday service. It was on Easter. And we had about 120 people here. And I looked at that and I said, boy, I must be doing a really good job here. And God smote me immediately and had me down on the altar just in the middle of the day. And I was bawling my eyes out. And God said, Mike, I will decide who comes to this church and who doesn't. And if you're not okay with that, I'll take you out and put somebody in that I can work with. And it scared me. And I said, God, please don't do that. I had, I had begged God to let me serve that church. And here he was establishing his authority over my life, saying, Mike, I'll be the one who's in charge. Now, if you'll trust me, I'll build this church in a way that you have never seen before. And he has. So just let God handle it. Let God have it. Let God worry about it. It's his church. He can do what he wants with it. We're the servants, not the masters, not the lords. And we just let God bring into our churches the people that he wants there, the number of people that he wants there. We let God worry about it. Uh, since we're short on time already today, I'm, I'm still just, uh, I don't know, it just kind of comes and goes. It's, it's been my stomach all this time. And um, I, I'm a little bit better today, a little bit more energy today. Uh, but it came time earlier for it, and I thought, man, I just can't do it, but I don't want to give up on it completely. So here we are, and I wanted to do this uh, for a while, and, and then I was studying something else this morning, and I thought maybe I'll try to tie the two together because they definitely go together. I don't know that I'll be able to do it today, but let's take our Bible. Let's turn to the book of Joel, if you would, please. The book of Joel. And we're going to look uh, through these chapters, one, two, three, and uh, remember, remember, Joel was a prophet, and remember that God speaketh once, yea, twice, in a dream and a vision. And so the rule is with the prophets that even though some of the things may have been already fulfilled out of Joel. If there are things specifically mentioned that God said was going to happen that haven't happened yet, it doesn't mean that they're not going to happen and God exaggerated or it was simply a metaphor for something else. It means that it's still going to happen and God's going to do it exactly the way God said he was going to do it. I was doing a, a study um, this morning of the word chariot or chariots in the Bible, reminding myself that the Hebrew word for chariot is merkaba, and that just happens to be a branch of Kabbalah mysticism. And I, I noticed something today reading an article on Wikipedia about Merkaba, which means chariots. 
that there are a couple of things that are implied with that sort of worship or that mysticism or that ritual. And it has to do, first of all, with ascension. Those who worship the chariots being ascended. And then the second part of it was, get this, unification. Not just ascending up to be with the chariots, but unifying ourselves with them, joining with them. They mingling themselves with the seed of men. And so that's going to come into chapter 2 when we see the description of Joel's army. But let's go to chapter 1. The book of Joel, I will be using the King James Bible today as if, uh, verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. God says this to Joel, hear this, ye old men. Joel then proclaims it to the people, hear this, ye old men, and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Now, I want you to notice something in verse 3. And, this, and, there's, and there's two verses back to back where a, a particular number just stands out as being highly significant. In verse 3, tell ye, starting with you, as the first generation, tell ye, your children, that's the second generation of it, and let your children tell their children, now we're at the third generation of it, and their children another generation. Now we're at four generations. And remember, what does that number represent? It represents the spiritual realm, what we would call the fourth dimension, the spirit dimension, the place where principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places are not the stars in the height of the heavens. God is in the height of the heavens, and that's the fourth direction given to us by Paul in uh, the book of Ephesians. And, so, and, and then I think it has uh, a connection with the third and fourth generation that God would carry uh, the sins of the fathers out on even unto the third and fourth generation. I think the meaning and the understanding of that fourth generation, or as he says here in Joel chapter 1 verse 3, another generation, which just happens to be generation number four, I think that generation is going to be a different genetic generation, a different one. It has to do, I believe, with the gospel, but in this case, the false gospel, as the Apostle Paul said, another gospel in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Then he says it again, just a page over in Galatians chapter 1, another gospel, which he said then is, it's a not another, because it's not good tidings of great joy. That's not what it is. It's bad news. Then he said, any other gospel, and then he said it again, any other gospel. So you have a recording of the Apostle Paul four times warning us about a fake gospel, a, something offered to the people of this world that would be an offer of eternal life, an offer of Godhood, like the serpent promised Eve that if she 
partook of the fruit, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And so I think it has everything to do with that. By the time they get to that fourth generation, that fourth generation is either going to be blessed forevermore as being the recipients of the gospel, or they're going to be cursed forevermore as a result of not giving heed to the true gospel, but they will in fact turn deliberately over to the false gospel. You see, I believe that everybody's going to make a choice. It's not going to it's not going to be forced upon them. People are not going to be tricked into it, misled into it. Oh oh no, this is just a simple vaccination. I don't think it's going to happen that way. I don't. Oh, there's nothing wrong with this this food. Go ahead and eat it. It's just like the food you ate yesterday and the day before. Ah, we tricked you. Now you've got the mark of the... I don't think it's going to be that way at all. I think people gladly... Gladly, it's 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 like a it's like a, a, an alcoholic sitting at a bar all alone, and a guy comes up and says, "Can I buy you a drink?" And what does the alcoholic say? Well, you sure can. In fact, you can buy me a dozen of them. You didn't have to trick him. You didn't have to say, here, I've got some nice ice water for you. Would you like to drink that? The alcoholic says, well, I don't want any ice water. I don't want vodka. I want Jack. Or, you know, as as teenage boys, you remember, guys? Somebody would invariably bring a dirty magazine to school and offer us a look at it. Would we turn it down? Usually not. We would accept it, knowing what it was, immediately. And I'm telling you that that mark that will transform that fourth generation is going to be chosen deliberately for what it is. They're going to want it. When it's offered to them, it will be done without trickery. They will receive it gladly, not by force, not by gun, not by threatening them, not by telling them you're going to lose your job if you don't do this. I think people are going to want this thing. They'll accept it. You tell people that they can cure all the diseases and let them live forever and they can keep all their money and they can keep all their sin at the same time. Right now, you already have a majority of the world that's going to accept that. So that's the, that's the first place he uses that number. So he's telling us this is not an ordinary event here. We're not just telling our grandchildren. We're going to tell our great-grandchildren this. Fourth generation. Then he says in verse 4, that which the palmer worm has left hath the locust eaten. That And, and the locust, I believe, you can go right back over to Revelation 9 and see that. And that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. These are all worms and these are all consumers. These are all devourers. These are all uninvited guests is what they are. And when they move through, They take out everything that is valuable to us. They'll take out our bean crop, our corn crop. They'll take out our 
our tea crop. They'll t- they'll chew all the leaves off the trees, the grass off the ground. They'll take everything in their path so that absolutely by the time the caterpillar comes around, which is number four, there is absolutely nothing left. They are God has sent them to destroy this land and to create hunger all over the world. And since there's four of them, we may not just be talking about hunger for bread, hunger for vegetables, hunger for, that does sound pretty good, bacon and tomato sandwiches. I never put, BLT, I never put lettuce on it. What lettuce to me is just in the way of the bacon and the tomato. Uh, It doesn't add anything as far as I'm concerned to it. But anyway, it's eating all of our lettuce. It's eating all of our tomatoes. It's eating this. It's eating that. And now our animals are dying because they have nothing to eat as well. But I think because of this number four here, What it's really done is that it's destroyed the leaves of a book, which is the word of God. Did not Amos prophesy that there was going to be a famine in the land, but not a famine of bread, but a famine of hearing the words of God. And so by the time that caterpillar comes around, there's nothing. In fact, let's let's stop for a minute. Let's stop for a minute. And I knew I knew as soon as I got started, it's been kind of cool in here all day, and I knew as soon as I got started, it would warm up. So let me turn my fan on a little bit here. Let's just let's just look at this for a minute. And in verse four, look at it from a from a modern historic uh, point of view. When I say modern historic, I'm saying we're not going to go back thousands of years. Let's go back. Let's go back 60 years. 60 years ago, that would have been, let's see, what, 1960, correct? In 1960, Generally, with the exception of some of the mainline denominations already using the Revised Standard Version, Clarence Larkin using it in um, his Dispensational Truth book, which I never understood how a King James-only church would allow teaching done out of a book that does not stick with the King James. It uses the RSV whenever it cannot find what it wants in the King James. I never understood that. I'm not being critical. I'm just asking. It's a legitimate question. Why would would churches teach out of or allow teaching out of dispensational truth when Larkin clearly, when he couldn't find what he wanted and the wording that he wanted in the King James, didn't have a problem in the world with going to the Revised Standard Version, which was the West Cotton Hort Bible. I just don't understand that. I mean, if your doctrine is valid and right and good and stable and authoritative, then you would need the RSV to back it up. It's just a point I want to make. But anyway, so let's say that we go back 60 years in this country and we find out that most of the churches are still using the King James. And I read a a book um, by a Baptist pastor, things that are different are not the same. Um... And he made a point in here, and he said, even when you had liberal churches, if they were using the King James, God, in a lot of cases, would honor that because God honors his word. And I went, that's a pretty good point. 
So there was God honoring his word, even in some of the more liberal churches. He was honoring his word. But then the Palmer worm moved in. So that's, let's say that's about 1973, when the um, New Testament of the NIV came out. Now we're, we're, the palmal worm has moved in, and it's starting to eat away at the way people think. It's starting to eat away some King James verses. Like, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's not the King James. That's the NIV. King James says only begotten son. That's the correct one. Then it, you know, people start becoming aware of missing verses. First John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And if you wanted to argue with somebody about the strength of the doctrine of the Godhead, Father, Son, or Word, and Holy Ghost, and you were going to use an NIV to prove that all three of them are one and the same entity, good luck. Good luck. Because it's not going to happen, because you don't have 1 John 5, 7 in your Bible. So that's the palmer worm. But the palmer worm didn't eat everything. So then by 1980, the Old Testament of the NIV has come, and now we've introduced... The New King James Bible, which is not the King James Bible. So now the palmer worm is gone, and now we have the locust. The locust shows up, starts eating away. So what it's doing is you have the phrase King James on it, which makes some people feel good. So they change Bibles from the King James to the New King James, being b believing, believing now what the marketing guys told them. All we did was change the these and thous. So that's all we did, which is not true. It's not true. In some of the readings of, of the New King James Bible, Rather than following the Textus Receptus Greek text, they followed the Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus text. They followed the corrupt texts that go along with the NIV, the New American Standard, and so on. So that's the that's the uh, the what the locust ate. But then they're not done. So now we have the canker worm coming in. The canker worm comes in and he brings in the New American Standard Bible, brings in the uh, New Living Testament, brings in the, um, oh, what are some of the other ones? The Mess Edge, the Mess Age brings in those Bibles to further eat away at what people conceive as the Word of God, which, by the way, they're no longer memorizing verses from the Bible the way we used to years ago. They can't. Whatever verse they memorize would have to be memorized out of a particular uh, translation. Well, if they have a... A, um, a Bible bowl and they're going to give young people a chance to stand up and recite, memorize scripture. Yeah, kids from one church are going to give you the NIV memorization. Kids from another church are going to give you the RSV or the New American Standard Version or they're going to give you the, uh, the New Living Translation or the Mess Age Translation or whatever. It's just eating away at the Word of God. And then by now we're getting to 
the caterpillar. What is the caterpillar? Caterpillar does something. Caterpillar does something. After the caterpillar has gone in and consumed what was left, what does it do? It transforms and it changes into a creature that has four wings. You see what's going on? See, the caterpillar basically builds its own coffin, the cocoon, and literally goes in there and dies and is transformed into a much more beautiful creature. Only this creature can fly. This creature has beautiful wings. It has beauty about it. It's not Satan transformed into an angel of light, the Bible says. So that's, that's what those four there are doing. And each one of these, I believe, palmer worm, locust, canker worm, caterpillar, they all represent spirits, consuming spirits, spirits that love to spoil us, which means take our stuff away from us, our good stuff, things that we depended on, things that we needed. It took it all away from us right in front of our eyes and then transformed at the end. So then he says in verse 5, Awake ye drunkards and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. What does the Bible say new wine is? Well, it's not a fresh bottle of Muscatel. It's not a, it's not a, a new bottle of Mogan David. New wine, the Bible says, comes from the cluster. So it's squeezed right out of the cluster. So that new wine represents the... Uh, the uh, to me, this is interesting. When they poured the wine there on the on the day of um, the day of Passover with Christ there at the Last Supper, and they're pouring out that wine, which I do not believe that it was fermented wine. When they pour out that wine, um. Jesus said, this is the blood of my new covenant. Now then, people have taken that and said, oh, we say uh, hocus pocus, alakazam, and we change this wine into the literal blood, red blood cells of Jesus Christ. But then they neglect the scriptures that tell us that what's in the grape is referred to by God in the Bible as the blood of the grape. So instead of Jesus referring and saying, this was grape juice and we're going to turn it into real blood, he just simply says, this that's in this cup, this new wine that came from the cluster, is the blood, because it's grapes' blood. And where did it come from? The vine made it. And who's the vine? Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. <laughs> amen. 
But that new wine is cut off from their mouths, which means they're not going to get any Bible doctrine. They're not going to get any Bible verses. They're not going to get any blood of the covenant of Jesus Christ. They're not going to get it. It's been cut off from their mouth, and they're not, they're not eligible for it anymore. Um, because, and, and look at verse 5 again. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. In other words, you're just a drunk anyway. I'm sure this new wine's not very appealing to you anyway because it ain't got no bite. It has no sting. It's not white lightning or anything like that. doesn't taste like moonshine. doesn't burn when it go down. doesn't make you see things. So then he says, verse 6. Here, and here we go. This is what, to me, this is what Joel is about. Joel is about this army that's coming. A very evil army. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number. That ought to tell you something whose teeth are the teeth of a lion. You check that up against Revelation 9, and that's exactly what you'll find out, is that the army that rises up out of the pit, that uh, tries to start a war, um, that is exactly their description. Their teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath, uh, the cheek teeth of a great lion. And it's a nation that has come up upon my land. Now, there are more descriptions of this, so don't rely just upon one place in the Bible to tell you what it is that they're going to look like. Verse 7, it says, He hath laid my vine waste... It barked my fig tree. It means he's torn the bark off of it. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest, the Lord's ministers, mourn. And I believe that there's going to come a time when it's going to become increasingly difficult for us to have church the way we want to have church. Um whether that's by some government control or here's another possibility for you. The people of this world just simply demand that the church is all changed to suit whatever they want. And so the churches do it. Is that unheard of? No, that's Rick Warren's whole business model was, and he said this in the Purpose Driven Church, that he had this little questionnaire and he went around Orange County, California, one of the wealthiest places in America, asked all these upper middle class to wealthy people what it would take to get you in our church. They said, well, quit singing them old hymns. Nobody likes them anymore. And don't be breathing down our necks about things we're doing wrong all the time. Don't We don't want to hear about sin, every sin that we do all the time, and so on and so on and so on. We want to hear smooth things when you preach. And so Warren said, I will accommodate that. And that's what's happened. 
Uh, the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest of the Lord's ministers mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth, for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up, and the oil languisheth. No more oil for the minister. No more wine for the congregation to partake of. No more corn for the people to eat their bread and be satisfied. Those things are all gone. They're all been taken away. Um, verse 11. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, howl. O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. You've got all these people who are raising cattle that are growing corn, wheat, and barley, and any other kind of grain they can get on, get their hands on. Maybe a little alfalfa to go along with it because they're going to save that to feed their cattle during the winter time when they know that nothing's growing. But those things have disappeared. So the only right thing for these churches to do is to pray and pray and or just replace then what they're feeding from what God has given them to some other kind of nonsense that the world has given them. Verse 12, the vine is dried up, the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, and the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Um, take your Bible, turn over to John chapter 15, John chapter 15, Jesus addressed this. It, it's like he knew it was coming. Who? John chapter 15. Verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. This is God's doing. And he says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth um, more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. And as for the branch, as and as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine; ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. And people, I've been down that road. I have been down that road. I've tried it. Tried to get away from doing things God's way. Trying to rely upon my own talent my own ability to speak, my own ability to come up with things to say. I used to rely upon that. I asked a young man in my church, I said, you know, I'm kind of having, kind of struggling here. I said, it sure help if I could get some more of our guys to say amen. And the guy said, you know, I'm to be honest with you, I'm kind of having a hard time getting into the messages. And I went, Gulp? How can that be? I'm Mike Hogger. Don't you understand? But definitely the Lord wasn't with me back then. I guarantee you that. Look at verse 
6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, listen, listen to what he said. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Mm -mm -mm. So, so shall you be my disciples. It is pleasing. It is pleasing unto God. When God's people are striving, are working, are laboring, are standing, opening their big mouths every now and then to get people's and draw people's attention to God, to spiritual matters. God says, if I see that in a church somewhere, I'm going to be right there with them. I'm not going to leave him. I'm not going to forsake him. It is my, it is my joy. It is my will that my people bear much fruit. Uh, I was reading this in um, Colossians. Turn to Colossians. No, 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 no. not Galoshes. Turn to Colossians. First Timothy, let's see, Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians. Here we go. I said turn here, but I don't have the first clue where I'm gonna where I'm gonna read from. Uh, yeah, here we go. Colossians chapter one, verse six which is come unto you as, as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. What's he talking about? He's talking about us with the word of God being used of us or the word of God abiding in us and then the word of God is what goes out, brings forth fruit as um, as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. So the, the fruitfulness of the saint is always going to be priority one with God. And God is the one. God is the one who produces the fruit in in you you can never ever ever produce it on your own it won't be right it won't smell right it won't won't act right won't do anything right Ezekiel Daniel Hosea Joel let's get back to Joel please in the few minutes that we have left I got to pack stuff Get on the road tomorrow, headed out to um, Fort Smith, Arkansas. And we are looking forward to it. Um, Pastor Ernie there at the church, they do stream their services. They stream them to Sermon Audio. Um, you'll ha have to... If I can find that page, I will tweet it out so that you can all uh, view the, the live stream. Um, I'll take some of our equipment down. What, what, even if we don't stream, I always record. If I go somewhere and speak, I always record. Even if it's something that I've talked about before, it's usually all new every time it comes out again. 
Where is Joel? Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Not Zechariah. There we go. Not Jonah. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Here we go. Back in Joel. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Uh, let's see here. Verse 12. The vine is dried up. The fig tree languisheth. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away uh, from the sons of men. And you know, what it, uh, you know what I think of when I read this is I think of Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. God said that if they would keep his commandments, his judgments, his principles, his precepts, um, that God would allow them, God would bless the fruit of their field. They would take a basket out and bring a great big heavy basket in. They knew to bring those harvests in when, because, because they were keeping God's word. They were doing what was right. But you cannot expect, listen to me, you cannot expect to live like the devil, to live like a dog, to disobey God's commandments, God's word. You cannot expect that you'll do that, but God will bless your life anyway with fruitfulness. He'll make you fruitful. He'll make you abound. He'll give you everything you ever asked for. God says, don't think of it that way because it doesn't happen that way. Verse 13 of Joel chapter 1, gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. Howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. This is interesting. He's, he's calling the... Um, the inside people, I think it would be called. You ministers of my God for the meat offering and drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Sanctify ye a fast. Instead of us having a feast now with, you know, all the blessings that God said he would bless them with, instead of having a feast, they're having a fast. Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the uh, house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall come. Mm -mm -mm. Is not the meat cut off uh, before your eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners have laid desolate. The barns, uh, excuse me, the, yeah, the barns are broken down for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle. Uh, are perplexed because they have no pasture, yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. And I believe he's talking about churches here, families. Places where God would be honored and blessed, but are is not. Because of the rampant sin, because of the rampant disobedience, because... These people have had the palmer worm and the locust and the canker worm and the caterpillar come in and steal away the word of God and the power of the word of God, the truth of God. It's, it's been taken all away and they did it. They did it. Now look at verse 17. The seed is rotten under the clods. My garners um, are laid desolate. The barns are broken down for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? And the herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will, will I cry for the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Um, 
and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers were dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pasture of the wilderness. There's a lot there. Now, I don't have time today, but I was going to get into, I was going to try to get to these chariots mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 2. So maybe, um, maybe while I'm gone, we're going to be leaving in the morning. It's going to be about a seven hour drive from here to Fort Smith. And, um, We'll be uh, we'll be gone Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. We'll be having services down there, and uh, so you study this. You study Joel chapter two, and 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 your the way you put your answer might be better than mine. So if you want to send it to me, you're more than welcome to. But study this chapter and find out find out what's happening here. And there is a there is a transformation that takes place in Joel chapter 2. I guarantee you. And it has to do with the chariots. The chariots are coming, people. You think, boy, it would be nice to see one of them chariots. I'm not so sure. I, I'd rather watch it on video. I'd rather see them on YouTube than see them in real life. Amen. But I do believe they're coming. Everything that I've seen tells me that that's the right, the right way to go. So be prepared, people. Be prepared. Now, some of you, some of you believe that by this time if this is calling for something at, you know either at the um, I forgot what I was going to say but anyway it's good to be with you today keep us in your prayers we're going to be traveling tomorrow about seven to eight hours pray that I feel better Sweetie Pie, they don't like to drive. You're the reason why we do what we do. You're the reason why I'm here today. It's because I love you and I care about you. And I want you to know what this book says. I think there's a lot of warnings in here that need to be heeded. Okay? So always think Bible in everything you do. And, uh, probably catch us online throughout the week during the services but until then we'll see you sunday morning lord bless you